Hello. 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 This is DM25, a radical political movement for Europe. I'm Meron Kedili, and today we have a special DMTV episode on the current conflict in Ukraine that dramatically escalated last week. As we're broadcasting now, it's the sixth day since Russian forces invaded their neighboring country of 40 million people. The UN is reporting today that 136 civilians have been killed, including 13 children and 400 injured, although in reality it's probably many more. The Russian government has announced that they will launch missile strikes in the Ukrainian capital city of Kiev. The West has responded with sanctions last weekend against Russia, airspace restrictions, military aid, as well as a dramatic increase in defense spending from Germany. But this conflict has deep roots and it certainly didn't start last week. Furthermore, it has potentially catastrophic implications for Europe and the world, triggering, or it has the potential at least to trigger waves of crises in energy, economics, and humanitarian crises, of course, with refugees. And similarly, the, the debate around the Ukrainian war has uh, become incredibly polarized. The war propaganda machine is spinning at hyper speed, and everyone's suddenly a Ukraine expert. History is being revised to fit certain narratives and progressives seem to be divided on issues like whether we should condemn US imperialism while blasting Putin's actions. And as the discussion rages, more Ukrainians are tragically dying as they mount a brave fight simply for defending their home. So in today's episode, we'd like to try and sift through all this. We've got our own Yanis Varoufakis here with us, as well as uh, Volodymyr Ishenko, a Ukrainian researcher based in Dresden. We've got a, a, a subset of our coordinating collective and several of our grassroots members. And of course, we've got you um, out there. So if you have anything you want to say, any questions, comments, rants, concerns, please put them in the YouTube chat and we'll put them to our panel. Now today, uh, if we'll do something a little bit different. We'll kick this off with some words from our grassroots members um, about this conflict, some, some, short, uh, some short words uh, from them. We'll start off with Anna Kolesnichenko, who is Ukrainian and based in Vienna. Anna. Hi, thank you, Mehran. <clears throat> Well, basically, I think you all see the news and uh, I, I guess we all realizing that this is a real war. And um, I know that uh, there are different views like which were especially um, present before the war that there is some um, play of great powers. And so let them play. As, and so, uh, but it all ended up in a real war and people are dying and i would say for ukrainians this is not abstract there is no like not great powers war but this is like russians killing ukrainians and so i would like uh, everybody to think about this um, like yeah like in real terms uh, not very abstract uh, and um, <clears throat> Also, um, from what I observe, I also have many Russian friends who don't support this. Uh, and so they are posting also different things. And one of the posts that struck me uh, yesterday was a citation, like a couple of paragraphs from Eric Maria Remar about the Second World War coming and how he was amazed to see like Germans before the war being mesmerized by Hitler how they were reading and discussing and how they were uh, like um, thinking that the whole world is um, somehow united, uniting against them and all sorts of rhetoric like this. And this is exactly what we see in Russia. So parallels with Hitler is 100%. So it's like not some kind of geopolitical play, it's a, a war of good versus evil. And this is how it's seen from Ukraine. And uh, also I uh, feel some compassion for Russians in a way because uh, their country was turned into concentration camp and they don't know about this. And now they realize it because when they go to protest, they're put in jail. And um, I think uh, during this war, uh, at the price of uh, this very high price of lives, it will be not only Ukraine, but also Russia liberated. But 
let's hope that the price doesn't get much higher. And in terms of European position and support, there are many ways that can, uh, many things that can be done now, but I think uh, as DM, as um, <clears throat> progressive movement, uh, we can uh, lobby and uh, pressurize for a uh, halt of uh, Germany and other European countries buying Russian gas, because right now this money is used to finance the war. So in this way, Europeans are financing this war. And so this is a priority number one that should be done. Also, um, I would say this goes very much uh, in line with the M agenda for greening, uh, uh, for Green New Deal and you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, reducing the use of gas and oil. So I would say this is a perfect opportunity to advance this agenda. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Anna. Let's get a, a view from Moscow now. Elisabetta Sharagina, mm -hmm. DM member from oh. Moscow. Thank you. I'm very uh, glad that I can uh, take part in this event. And uh, uh, Anna told about uh, some letters uh, which were made in Russia. I also want to tell about uh, one letter uh, which was made by uh, several activists uh, who represent uh, left-oriented and democratic oriented uh, activists and uh, they asked uh, uh, people uh, not to forget that uh, anti-war protests uh, which are uh, very important but also they should be um, there should be protests uh, social oriented and uh, it's very important for uh, left oriented activists in Russia uh, who still can do something because uh, now it's time not very good for left oriented uh, people here uh, and uh, what I try to speak about uh, as I present uh, cultural questions uh, in Russia. And I still think that enlightenment and education for uh, people in different countries can help. Uh, and I hope very much that uh, movement DIEM can uh, make some publishing programs uh, to translate important books uh, I told already about uh, books by Yanis, uh, which were translated in Russian, and uh, that was, was very helpful for left-oriented and democratic-oriented activists. And uh, I should say that uh, we see here that it was just uh, the problem of uh, inequality for classes, for countries, when this uh, inequality rises, uh, it then it can be uh, broke through. And uh, this time and uh, in this place, it suddenly broke through and it was uh, disaster, disaster for, uh, for all the people here. Uh, but uh, we could see this inequality. And uh, mm, for example, uh, all the sanctions were made already here by, our country itself. Uh, we don't have uh, possibility for science education here. It uh, doesn't exist here because uh, there is no equal uh, position for scientists, for example, in Russia and in Europe, in other countries. Uh, by the way, one more letter uh, was written by mathematicians uh, who work in Russia they also made this petition, anti-war petition, and they said that our science uh, is still uh, very important for us, uh, but uh, there is no possibility uh, for science to live in this uh, disaster, disaster and in this time. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Elisaveta. Sorry, sorry to hurry you on there. Nina Petrov from Serbia. Hi everyone. Um, 
So first of all, I think we can all agree here that uh, we're strongly against any military action taken at the current time uh, from, from any side. And I would like to emphasize that this is not the way to resolve any conflict. And this is what we're here to talk about today. But um, most of all, I would like to discuss what is the power of civil society in times like this? What can we do in our own countries and how can we um, overturn this situation? So uh, my heart does go to the people of Ukraine, the innocent people that are uh, standing in someone's way. Uh, but also my support goes to all the Russian citizens that are fighting, they're trying to fight this regime that is implementing terror. And uh, I think that we should support each and every activist in, in Russia at this moment. Um, I, will, I will keep this short. Uh, having that said, we uh, have launched a campaign uh, calling for action from civil society worldwide. Um, and you can find it on our um, DM25 website. It is called No More Wars. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nina. And now let's move over to Yanis. Thank you all, all three of you for your important contributions. And let's move to Yanis and then we'll hear from Volodymyr Ishenko. Yanis. Good evening, everyone. At the moment in history when the people is being invaded by an army of occupation. When their homes are being violated, when their neighborhoods are being bombarded, when young and old people who had never touched a gun before take up arms to defend their homeland. At that moment, we have simply to bow our heads to them, uh, to um, support them, to do anything in our power to empower them, uh, independently of whether they're Ukrainians, Palestinians, Kurds, Iraqis, uh, Polisario rebels in Western Sahara, we, you know, DiEM25, um, we do not discriminate between victims, victims of aggression. Um, unlike the, the, the systemic media who treat a Palestinian woman who picks up a rock to throw at the Israeli forces uh, about to demolish her home and they call her a terrorist um, uh, or whether they we're talking about a woman in uh, Kharkiv who is putting together a lot of cocktail we treat them as freedom fighters we make no distinction between them now let me be clear about Mr Putin he chose war it was not imposed upon him it wasn't the Ukrainians it wasn't Washington, it wasn't NATO, it wasn't some divinity. It was his choice and he is going to be condemned in the annals of history for that barbarism. Uh, the choice of war is a crime in itself. Whether he's actually committed war crimes, this is a formal definition by, according to the Geneva Convention, is something we'll work out later on. But as far as I'm concerned, he's a war criminal anyway. And I've been saying this, this since the early 2000s because of the crimes against humanity that Putin personally instigated in order to become the first president of Russia that reclaims territory back. That was Chechnya, when he completely flattened Grozny, killing 250,000 people under false pretenses in order to solidify his power. This is the kind of man we're talking about. This is not something new for me. I've been saying this now, as I said, since 2001. I shudder to think what he's going to do to Kiev uh, if the resistance continues. I want the resistance to continue. I want the resistance to win. But I shudder to think that he may try out in Kiev what he's done in Grozny. I shudder to think what, what he's doing as we speak to our Russian comrades in prisons across Russia for having demonstrated against his evil regime. I remember a few years ago, I was uh, on stage in Edinburgh in, in Glasgow, uh, in, sorry, in Glasgow, in Scotland, with uh, Maria Aljokina from Pussy Riot, listening to the Howard details of the torture that she suffered in Siberian prisons. Let me now come to what I think our, my contribution can be here. What is the solution at this moment? 
The Ukrainians have been led up the garden path by NATO, by Washington for years. They've been promised things that were never going to be delivered. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, and this is something I've been advocating over the last uh, few days, I just float it up here because I don't want to take too much of your time. For me, there are two potential outcomes for the next few years. One is uh, in the pursuit of an impossible and unsustainable tar um, aim of uh, a Ukraine that becomes a, maybe a, a NATO member to have a protracted occupation and tens of thousands of deaths in the Ukraine as we speak. The only alternative, which uh, I think is fathomable and one that is potentially a good outcome for Ukrainians is uh, a Finland-like neutral agreement, neutrality agreement to be brokered between Washington and Moscow. The European Union doesn't exist. It has become absolutely obsolete and irrelevant. It is simply running behind. It has become the tail of uh, the United States. Uh, and I'm putting this forward, the Finlandization of the Ukraine, knowing full well what Finlandization was, it was a fantastic opportunity for Finland to avoid being gobbled up by Russia after a war and the resistance by the people of Finland, like the ones the resistance now by Ukrainians. It was a process that led to 80 years of peace, prosperity, democracy, and freedom and independence by Finland. If we care about Ukrainians and we do not care about the interests of NATO, of our own little ideologies here and there, I think we should be pressing our friends in the Ukraine to bargain, to fight, to resist, because the only way of convincing Putin that a Finland-like solution is palatable to him is if the resistance in Ukraine succeeds in exacting a large cost upon the Russian army. The sanctions do the same thing at the economic sphere. Then and only then, an agreement between Moscow and Washington could be sold by Putin to his own regime, to his own people, as a kind of victory for him. But at the same time, it will be the optimal outcome for a Ukraine. And if we want, as a European Union, this is my what I propose, if we want to support this independent but neutral Ukraine, we can do that. We can invest massively, especially in the green transition and so on, education, health, infrastructure as Europeans. We don't even need to have formally the Ukrainians inducted in the European Union, if that is the way to get the um, uh, occupying armies out of the Ukraine. Uh, the very simple choice we now have is between a solution that stands a chance of ending the carnage, preventing a long-term occupation, and granting Ukrainians the right to live in democracy and with freedom and without being under the thumb of the Russian bear, uh, uh, or pursuing the kind of line that NATO and the Washington establishment has been pushing Ukrainian governments towards since 2014, a dead end that is uh, leading to, to today's uh, absolutely outrageous circumstances. I'm looking forward to, to the debate. Thank you, Yanis. Volodymyr Ishenko. Thank you so much for inviting me here. So I'll try to use these five minutes as, uh, as usual as, as possible. Uh, so when this whole escalation started uh, a few months ago, I made uh, a number of interviews. I wrote uh, several op-eds. I've been explaining to the Western media about the complexity of relations of between Ukrainians and Russians uh, since Russian Empire in the Soviet Union. I've been explaining about the Euromaidan revolution, which uh, I closely study, about all the problems of the post-Maidan uh, regime in Ukraine with the nationalist radicalization, with, uh, with the far right, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, but uh, now you should very clearly understand that the person who pushed the button and started the war is uh, called Vladimir Putin. He is the primary responsible for the war and he must be stopped. Uh, I've been uh, very critical to post-Maidan regime in Ukraine. Um, I've been a target of a couple of hate campaigns, I've received threats from the people who actually killed other um uh, uh, other people uh but uh, i also remember that how 19 years ago i uh, joined a uh, march in kiev uh, against the invasion of iraq uh, by the united states and this was a part of the global day of action which is claimed to be the global protest events in the whole history and uh, all the left understood that saddam hussein was uh, a brutal dictator, brutally repressive against the communists, against the courts, but foreign occupation was uh, would lead to horrific, horrible consequences, for not only for Iraq, but for, for the whole region. And uh, uh, now uh, we need to discuss how to stop Putin. So uh, one of the line of actions by the EU is sanctions. Um, I think uh, I'm like I'm not the, like the best person in the circle to to discuss how what what is the impact of the financial section sanctions. And I think Yanis has actually probably will has much more to say about this. Uh, uh, but I would only uh, re uh, re remind you that. Uh, discussion of the SWIFT cuts, uh, banning Russian banks, uh, not allowing them to use trade in dollar and euro. They've been all, all since 2014. And I think the Russians were preparing for this. And also I'll remind you that uh, China is practically openly supporting Russia and uh, without that uh, probably a, a covered agreement, uh, Putin would probably not uh, risk to start the war. Uh, I mean, agreement with China. Uh, another line of the European Union is sending more arms to Ukraine. Uh, sending arms uh, to the people who uh, fight against the aggression is uh, probably not a bad thing. Uh, but if it's uh, not supplemented with uh, any attempt for to reach a political solution, uh, that would mean that uh, European Union is uh, creating a kind of like Afghanistan on, on, on the territory of Ukraine. That would lead uh, indeed to massive destruction of Ukrainian cities, massive losses of uh, civilian lives and uh, that's uh, I, I don't think that uh, that uh, this is what Ukraine actually uh, needs. And we also understand that uh, Putin uh, bet almost everything on this invasion. If he loses in Ukraine, he loses his power. And that means that he would use whatever means possible not to lose. He already uh, threatened the world with the nuclear weapons. So uh, this is also a risk that we need to understand. Uh, one of the uh, possible political compromises uh, that uh, is starting to discuss now in uh, Ukrainian media, in Russian uh, media, in, in some Western analysis, uh, that uh, it's connected to today's vote in the Euro Parliament for uh, recommending to accept Ukraine to the European Union. And uh, this can be uh, indeed a part of a deal, uh, a part of a quick uh, peace solution for Ukraine that could prevent uh, massive destruction assaults on, on Ukrainian cities. Uh, Ukraine could uh, become a part of the European Union. And uh, the other part of the deal uh, would be a neutral status for Ukraine that uh, Russia demands, and probably some uh, compromises on Donbass, on Crimea, and uh, a weird thing that Putin calls denazification. And we also need to understand uh, what, what exactly it means for him now, but he 
he left for him a, a, a big space to decide what it could be. Uh, the benefits of this deal would be that uh, both for Ukrainian and for the Russian government, it would be possible to present it as a victory. Ukrainians were fighting for uh, European Union since the Euromaidan revolution. And uh, that would be the uh, culmination of this, of this fight. Putin would also, could also be uh, capable to present the Ukraine's neutrality compromises on Donbass and Crimea as a victory for, for him and uh, would not be pushed to, to, to the wall and uh, uh, offend with uh, whatever means are in his disposal. So I think if if this uh, deal is something that is realistically discussed among the European, Ukrainian, and Russian elites, I think that would be the best thing that Ukraine can get now, and that would uh, prevent massive destructions and loss of uh, thousands, more maybe even millions of lives in our country. Thank you, Volodymyr. Um, a couple of questions from. The chat and comments. Uh, one question on the on the proposal of a Finland-style neutrality for Ukraine that you you and Yanis both referenced. The thing is, says Abilson, how can Ukraine do this? I mean, ideally we want it to be at Switzerland, but how without leaning towards the West or towards Russia? Niels Waldorf says one thing to defend Russia, given the historical context, the West has always been the aggressor. That's why I think Putin doesn't feel safe. We, i.e., we in the West, are savage beasts with no values. Raytheon Lockheed Boeing chose war. And Kostas asks, what do you think about NATO's position between what's happening right now with Russia bombing Ukraine and NATO bombing Belgrade back in the 90s? And we have a good person to answer that as someone who lived through that NATO bombing campaign in the 90s, Ivana Nenadovic from Belgrade. Ivana. Hi, good evening, and uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to have this variety of voices, and uh, this is why I decided to stay in this panel, although I wanted to pull out uh, because of the level of emotions that uh, it brings back, and uh, I, I would like to mention another part of the war that uh, is always brutal and never a solution and more arms and guns are not going to bring peace. That's one thing that I can say for sure. Uh, is the cultural war or the word of war of words uh, that is happening uh, at the same time and mainly on the left spectrum. And when I look at uh, the, the people that are pretty much on the same page, uh, regarding condemning, condemning any kind of aggression, brutality, and uh, denial of sovereign countries. Uh, at the left, I can see this need to be on the right side this, uh, at this point of history. This high moral ground that we will take in, and then we will condemn Putin which is in order, and of course, we should do that. However, what I would like to emphasize from my experience is that when we say Russia or when we say Putin, it also spills over to the people of Russia. And as Elisaveta uh, told us, there are progressive uh, Russian people who are trying to fight uh, this oppression for a very long time. Same as we in Serbia tried to fight, and we did fight uh, Milosevic, and we did fight uh, the, 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 his oppression and his dictatorship, and then we ended up being bombed. This is one big um, injustice that I can um, tell you about, it's not something that will help you much, but uh, it, is, it is something that is perceived as injustice, especially because this whole region of Eastern Europe, ex uh, SSSR, ex Yugoslavia is very difficult for our Western friends to understand and comprehend. And all of a sudden we have 
uh, this big interest and uh, so to say, quote unquote, geopolitical knowledge about this region, which doesn't really exist uh, because of various reasons. Each side will have their own point of view. Of course, there is a history of uh, oppression, repression and um, antagonism. And what we should do as internationalist movement is uh, to bring people closer together, to, to, to understand that war doesn't end, even if I hope that it will end soon for Ukraine and, uh, Ukrainian people. I doubt it will happen. And even if it, the peace agreement would be signed tomorrow, war lingers on uh, and has its aftermath. And in ex-Yugoslavia or in Serbia, because Serbia bears the legacy of Yugoslavia and everything that was bad and connected to Yugoslavia uh, is uh, something that Russian people will suffer for a very long time. And when Putin is gone and has his uh, place in history books, but we must be careful about more divisions, especially on the left, on the side where people are thinking uh, progressive or humanitarian at least, um, and try not to, to make, create more divisions that we already uh, unfortunately have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivana, for that. Juliana Zita. Uh, thank you, Mehran. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, of course, uh, also my empathy and solidarity to the Ukrainian people. Um, it's uh, just devastating. And I think um, just after six days, um, I can still not wrap my mind around what's happening here. And especially uh, from the German perspective, uh, developments within the last days are... Um, are really scary, to be honest. Um, um, and it's not comparable with being in Kiev right now and in Ukraine. But, you know, if you look into the future and you see the narrative that the European Union is building up for itself, being great and, you know, giving spending more money on, on military is just mind blowing to me. And even more so because now you can read headlines like uh, it's so great that Germany is taking, taking the lead and I couldn't have ever imagined that the world would be cheering Germany for spending enormous amounts of money on military. And this is quite confusing for people of my generation for sure. Um, because I don't, and to be honest, I don't see anyone here in Germany ever taking their guns and, and defending themselves like the Ukrainian people do now bravely. I, I don't think that we could pull that off here, to be honest. This is, uh, this is an illusion that people have in, the, in, in, in Germany now, where I live, that we can defend ourselves against people like Putin who sit on a button with nuclear weapons. And... Um, I think it's the wrong direction, extremely the wrong direction. And I agree with Ivana. Uh, if you prepare for war, war will probably come. And um, this is kind of um, this narrative of a strong Europe is, is just hot air for me because before the invasion began, you could see that Janus is completely right that the EU was completely irre irrelevant in negotiating. I mean, it's, it's not news that Putin is evil for me. I was protesting something I did. I, did. I don't even remember what it was 15 years ago with friends of mine of, who are Russians. You know, it's, this is not the news to me, but the news to me is, is that, that, for example, now we cheer up a politician like Scholz for building up military, a politician that was the, one of the most cor corrupt on the ballot last year. He is involved in the uh, XCOM file scandal. He beat up plenty of us leftist people at the G20, uh, um, you know, uh, assembly in, in Hamburg that happened. Um, he has so many disasters and scandals on his side that anyone who believes that this man will secure uh, Germany or Europe in the ne next years is just delusional. I'm sorry. So please, people in Europe, do your homework when it comes to 
to this government in Germany, when it comes to the people who are promising you a secure Europe, because it's just not true. I don't believe in that. And I think that the left really quickly must unite anti-war, anti-nuclear weapons, anti-everything that can really just blow us off this earth. And, and yeah, this is for, for, for now my statement. On this. Thank you for that, Juliana. Do from Germany. Dusan Pajevic, based in Montenegro. Thank you, Mehran. Yeah, I will start narrowly, then I will expand towards the wider context. Uh, first of all, let me say that I come from a country that uh, suffered from both NATO aggression and denial of our identity and sovereignty. Uh, I hear each day that my country is a communist lie and that we as a nation don't exist. So I deeply identify with Ukrainians, uh, even though this is uh, on a much larger scale, of course. And we need to be explicit as a movement against uh, the all imperialistic tendencies. Uh, Russia and USA are playing their games through Montenegro. First Green Party uh, of Montenegro broke the ruling coalition with extreme right-wing Serbian party Democratic Front because USA officials said that they are not uh, considered pa partners. So basically Green Party didn't mind being in the coalition with literal fascists until West said that it is a problem. Then DF was meeting with the Russian intelligence before they block every road in Montenegro, which they did on the day uh, that Russia invaded Ukraine, actually. Also, uh, Green uh, Party leader and vice prime minister was having a dinner with uh, Russian paramilitary organization. And now DF, Democratic Front, is opposing uh, to organize to organize an assembly where new minority government needs to be formed. Uh, to have a side note, uh, they were accused of trying to stage a coup with the Russian group back in 2016 to prevent Montenegro from, jo from joining NATO. Uh, now they are organizing pro-invasion protests, and I just want to say that I'm deeply ashamed of those people that are uh, at these protests now as we speak. Uh, it is very, very important to note uh, what Ivana said, and that is the fact that uh, not all Serbs support the Democratic Front, nor all Russians support the war. So I stand with peace, and I stand with Ukraine, and all the progressives around Europe, and I think those phrases are actually synonyms. Uh, wars and imperialistic tendencies only benefit 1% of people, and they are definitely not a majority. And this is a war of Putin and Russian oligarchs, and it's disgusting. Uh, on the other hand, uh, no, NATO is not a solution. Neither is neocolonial view towards Slavs. And we need a different alternative as soon as possible in order to stop Ukrainians from suffering. This may sound a bit utopic, but uh, in a difficult times like this, allow me to dream at least. Uh, I call and I think we need the demilitarization of the world and direction of those funds uh, to be redirected towards the green transition. Uh, you, uh, if you mind that your country is dependent on the Russian gas, then you should also mind that it is dependent to any gas, basically. Uh, gas and oil companies are lobbying already to build more infrastructure in the European Union, and we need uh, renewables and not uh, these things they try to pass as green. While the world is looking at the direction of war, they have this sneaky taxonomy which labels nuclear and gas as sustainable. And DM25 is going to stand up to that. Uh, we won't let back, uh, back door slip on this. Nuclear energy is a starting point for nuclear weapons that is dangerous and expensive, and gas is destructive uh, fossil fuel. Don't let them paint it green. Uh, we've seen that 100 billions from Germany uh, has went to military budget, 
And uh, that is a pure example that we have the means to do this transition now, uh, not, fun, not to fund military, which pollutes dirt further. The US military, for example, produces more CO2 than many states, including Sweden, Nor uh, Norway, and Hungary. Also, let me uh, not start about the land pollution because one of my great friends uh, got leukemia because of the NATO bombing, because he was swimming in the area near uh, where NATO dropped their depleted uranium bombs. So I cannot forget that basically. Uh, once again, glory to Ukraine and brave people and fighters from there. Russia needs to stop this brutal invasion. And unfortunately, I have to stress that NATO won't save you. Uh, they are criminal organization that works for profit and not for peace. As Yanis said, uh, independent and, and neutral Ukraine is needed. No wars between nations and no peace between classes. Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much for that, Dushan. And, and um, a reference there to our Don't Paint It Green campaign. And uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, and of course, actions to try and stop the war in Ukraine. I mean, everybody in DM has been protesting all weekend, but we will be designing and coming forward with, with specific campaigns on this. Please join us. It's dm25.org slash join. Uh, don't just sit on the sidelines. Let's do something together on this. A, a couple of uh, quick comments from the chat here. Um, the EU hates opposing views, banning Sputnik, Sputnik and RT the Russian, uh, Russian owned media means you are not allowed to listen to wrong think. This is totalitarianism. Another comment, Matthew says, where is the sadness for the people of Ukraine after the US coup in 2014? Uh, this commonly held view that the, the Euromaidan revolution was backed by the US. Let us now hear again from Elizaveta Shargina from Moscow, Elizaveta. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for all of you. And Dushan uh, said uh, very important words that uh, it's very difficult to say just in few minutes. But uh, you know that uh, both Russia and Ukraine had a long history, and in nineties when this. Uh, uh, as you told some personalities, but there was Yeltsin, Putin, they came and they brought uh, these ideals of free market just from a uh, capitalistic world. And uh, people were uh, just, uh, uh, they tried to find their way, but uh, it was very difficult. And uh, now this militarization goes together with the finishing of internal internalistic uh, ideas of ideas of uh, uh, that people are equal uh, it came to us and uh, that's i think that's a long long way to come back to uh, to their ideas um, and uh, we have now in our country also and both in russia and ukraine uh, decommunization, you know, that's our main uh, process. But uh, uh, communism gave also uh, the ideas of um, that people are equal. So <clears throat> we have to <clears throat> return to these ideas through culture and through education. I see no other way. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Let's bring Yanis Varoufakis back in. Yanis. I'd like to, uh, to take the opportunity to answer some of the things, uh, the questions put on the YouTube chat and on Twitter. Uh, the first question is, well, wasn't Finlandization a terrible thing for Finland imposed upon it? Well, it was imposed upon it as a result of a war with Russia. Uh, but was it terrible? Finland was a fully fledged democratic country. Yes, they had to keep a little bit quiet uh, regarding their criticism of the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, they have no doubt that if they had a choice between Finlandization and no Finlandization, they would have chosen the latter, all other things being equal. In other words, not being gobbled up 
by Russia. Uh, let me tell you that, you know, I'm getting on a bit in life. Uh, I'm old enough to remember living in a NATO country um, that also had a fascist right-wing dictatorship uh, here in Greece. And I can tell you that back then, we were dreaming of being Finland. We were thinking of either Finland or Austria, countries that were not in NATO, not in the European Union, as dreams come true for their people. And we were right, because Austria, Finland, in a state of Finlandization, of neutrality, achieved a remarkable attainments, remarkable outcomes, politically, technologically, educationally, health-wise, in terms of a social democracy. That would not be bad for Ukraine today. Somebody else asked me, well, who will guarantee the neutrality of Ukraine? Um, you know, even if Putin agrees for five minutes, then he can change his mind tomorrow. Well, that's not our, my proposal. It's not our proposal. Our proposal is that this should be the result of a summit between the United States of America and Russia, the result of an agreement, a binding agreement, including demilitarization of the border areas of Donbass, uh, one that was guaranteed by both sides. And you know, Putin would actually appreciate that because he would be able to show to his own people, to his regime, to his party, to whatever machinery keeps him going, that um, he's being taken seriously by uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, another question is, well, shouldn't Ukrainians decide if that's what they want? Absolutely. We are Democrats. But for the Ukrainians to decide, uh, there are two prerequisites. The first one is that they are told the truth by the West, by the European Union, not to be led up the garden path, because this is what the European Union is doing. It's promising them things that it is not pre prepared to deliver. This thing now about, you know, uh, um, the entry of Ukraine into the European Union, they can promise it till they're blue in the face. They don't mean it. There's no way that Berlin is going to accept Ukraine as a member of the European Union, even if they say that they will. Not for a very long time, and certainly not while Donbass is um, occupied, uh, not while the, the, you know, the, the economy is in tatters. So first you need to rebuild Ukraine before there's any chance of entry into the European Union. Um, and, and finally, uh, allow me to say this. Over the last 48 hours in Twitter space and Facebook, I've, we've all been engaged in debates. Uh, we've all been attacked by trolls for things we've said. One of the most interesting attacks I've received uh, where it was from the former prime minister, the ultra right wing Alexander Stubbs of Finland, uh, who was back in 2015 the finance minister of Finland. He had been demoted from prime minister to finance minister. And he was in the Eurogroup doing the bidding of Wolfgang Schäuble against Greece, right? And he was giving me and us Greeks lectures about, you know, that we were the grasshoppers of uh, the Mediterranean and we had to take the pain of the Troika and austerity and so on. Uh, we need to cut tiny little pensions by the most impoverished of pensioners by 50%. Yeah, he was actually doing all that when we were in the Eurogroup. And interestingly, why am I saying that? Because now that I'm talking about Finland, he says, oh, what right do you have to talk about my country? Our history is for us to judge, not for you. Interesting, isn't it? Huh? These people think that they have the right to steamroll, like, you know, like a tank going over your country. But the moment you start having opinions about theirs, suddenly you are greek explaining or west explaining. Now, comrades, this is why we have DiMA25. We do not believe in national boundaries when it comes to debates. I have every right to have a view about every part of Europe, including Russia. Huh? Like you have, everybody has a right to have an opinion about the tiniest village anywhere in Greece. In DiEM25, we do not respect borders. We do not respect different jurisdictions where, you know, you are an expert in your country and I'm an expert. No, here we vote together about everything. We have debates about every part of Europe, indeed every part of the world. And this is why DiEM25 is important. And allow me to end by saying that as DiEM25 
has established and shown in the last seven years, six years of our existence, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Turkey, Greece, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, we are one. And we are going to have this debate along the lines of humanist principles that apply to all of us. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, Nina Petrov from Serbia, and then we'll bring Volodymyr Shinko back in. Nina. Um, thank you. Uh, from the beginning of this uh, conflict, ever since it got as violent as it, as it did, I keep hearing people talking about the uh, war in Bosnia and how this reminds them of the war in Bosnia and the NATO aggression over Serbia. But this is not the only resemblance that I feel as a citizen of Serbia with the situation nowadays. I also feel um, compassionate with the people in Russia and Belarus. And why is this? Because uh, the regimes that they have is so similar to ours. We had a referendum in Belarus on Sunday. And uh, if anyone is crazy enough to believe that the people of Belarus had any right, had any vote, um, you are pretty delusional. Uh, in Serbia, we don't really have any rights to, to, to vote. And every election, every referendum is already being decided for us. Um, before the referendum ended uh, on Sunday, uh, I could see a lot of campaigns coming from the Ukrainian side about how we should implement sanctions towards the Belarus citizens and everyone who is even, you know, who happened to be born in Belarus, just as the people who happen to be born in Russia, no matter what they stand for. And uh, the only thing I can say is that in these situations, uh, the citizens under oppressive regime are even more driven to, to, to support their leaders because they feel personally attacked. And this is me coming from a, a genocidal nation, uh, right? They will be labeled, uh, they will be labeled for good. And um, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, there is no uh, a decent human being across these countries that is supportive of what's going on at the moment. And I, I, I really think that as Dushan said, this is oligarchy playing games and uh, Ukraine is their playground and we are all their pawns in this game. And this is this is why we all of us have to stand up and, and take take power back into our own hands, say what we really want and make them listen. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nina. A couple of quick comments uh, from the chat. NATO should have been dismantled along with the Warsaw Pact uh, in World War II. Says Vorsichtig, one, two, three. Uh, Belgium, Denmark, and the Netherlands declared their neutrality before the Nazis invaded them. It doesn't do anything. The Nazis invaded them anyway. And CH says, I do think the West is held to a higher standard by the left than the regimes in China and Russia. That's how it feels as an Englander. Volodymyr. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I just uh, two comments to what, what Janis said uh, <clears throat> about EU that could promise, 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 but never accept. I think what's more realistic to get from them now is a kind of like a membership plan, of course, not expedited uh, uh, acceptance to the EU, but uh, a clear membership plan, maybe for many years, but uh, with milestones, with, with everything, but with a very clear goal that Ukraine becomes a member of the European Union. And that may work. Uh, because uh, for Ukraine, it's also that that's, uh, those guarantees that they uh, actually call for uh, before accepting the neutral status. There is indeed a, a, a very understandable need in the guarantees after being attacked by the neighboring country. And uh, being a part of the European Union, uh, and the European Union, which is starting to spend so much money on the weapons, is a guarantee. And uh, but uh, of course, that's uh, not exactly that uh, progressive vision of the world. So on that, that's uh, simply um, something like look, look looks like a realistic solution for the horror which goes or goes on in Ukraine right now. Uh, but uh, more. Uh, uh, long term, more like forward vision uh, would be, of course, the complete restructuring of the security in Europe, the, because we, we also need to understand that whoever would 
uh, replace Putin as the president of Russia, even if he would be like a democratic socialist, even if he would be Navalny, the main oppositionist. If, so far as NATO remains exclusive towards Russia, Russia would continue to see NATO as a threat. And uh, without the fundamental solution of this uh, common security pro problem, uh, as common structure for the European countries, for Ukraine, for Russia, uh, that problem won't, won't go away. And of course, it's just completely impossible even to imagine that Ukraine and Russia would ever be in a, any common structure after this uh, invasion. But we also need to recall that uh, Germany, France, and Poland are now in the European Union together, even after the, the incomprehensible horrors of the Second World War that Germany uh, put on, on Europe. But after the regime change and uh, some years, it, it has become possible. And so we need also to see, have this perspective in, 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 on our agenda and in, in our vision. Thank you, Volodymyr. Juliana Zita, Germany. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I just wanted quickly to add that um, um, building on what Jana said about that we must think without borders. And I think the, the, the point is that, that money, for example, and the most powerful, they don't think within borders. <laughs> and this is where they are <clears throat> ahead of most of us progressives, is that we, we act like there's just one single interest from one single country being like Putin in, in Russia. But, uh, but of course, I think that if you heard the oligarchs who are with him, you can change much more than uh, talking in, in military strategic senses. Um, and I think for us on this planet, so to say, to at some point have no wars anymore, we must, what, I mean, Dushan, you said that it is kind of Ethiopian, but there, I, I don't see any way out. Uh, we have to kind of make a quit uh, to history. You know, we have to stop looking back because we will never get each other's perception 100%. I can never know exactly how it is to to li to live in Poland or to live in even North Macedonia, where I come from. I'm from. I live in Germany. I don't even have a full clue how the country I'm coming from is functioning. So, so it cannot be that we all have to understand each other first to have peace. <laughs> that will never happen. So we must just leave things as they are sometimes and not go but what is with this war and this war i mean we condemn all wars and the question for me is how we gain peace and i, I want to quote, quote something that the dalai lama wrote a few days ago he said 20th century was a century of bloodshed the 21st century must be a century of dialogue and i agree with that strongly and i think this is something that we have to change in our human perception of how we solve conflicts and not go back to the old playbooks and try to resolve every conflict with the same same historical approach which leads to the same outcome um, so yeah i think for the future it's just we have to go freedom for the many and j for the few and then we can talk about real freedom and peace thank you juliana amir kiai a policy coordinator. Hi, good evening and uh, thanks Mehran. Um, it's important and very critical to point out that we, and as uh, Dushan has mentioned, Ivana, Nina, etc., and everybody else, that uh, here we have the power of the people has been mostly taken away from us and there's very little. But at the same time, it's about taking the power back. And part of that is actually getting our ourselves as the people, as the public, and also civil society to proactively organize towards peace. And that's very critical because the annual military spending of $2 trillion a year is only set to increase given the moves by Germany. And of course, France will follow suit and so will the other countries as well, because they all have to start matching each other of the inherent fear of the neighbor attacking. So we know that this spending will also rapidly increase, even though we know that even if we disagree about sustainable development goals, it will only cost three trillion a year to implement all the uh, SDG goals that's out there. So it's 
it really is about political parity, about diverting the spending that we have now away from militarization and into the areas that we want, whether it's shifting into free public transport, free and universal healthcare, localization of renewable energy, and so on and so forth. And those are some of the demands we can make from our elected representatives. But more importantly, we know that civil society needs to get really activated about this and organize for peace. And that's why we've launched a call, uh, a petition that people can sign at dm25.org forward slash peace, where we're calling for end to overseas military bases, expulsion of foreign troops from all regions, um, divestment of public and private funds in the arms industry, striking at arms manufacturing companies, no pasaran to transportation of weapons, making the arms industry and lobbyists and supporters visible to the public, and so on and so forth. NATO, CSTO, CSTP, all these acronyms will not bring security for us. Militarization will never be able to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Um, some last comments from the chat here. How many of us hear from Western media what the Azov fascists did in Donbas? Um, someone else is shouting out to Matt Taibbi's article on how the US fostered the rise of Putin, given, despite his corruption. Yes, it's, it's a good piece, taibbi.substack.com. Um, and from Eric Sapp, criticize people, uh, sorry, criticize Putin, if you like, that if you're a North American or a European, NATO is your responsibility, so you need to criticize it. It is your moral duty. Yanis. A very brief comment um, regarding the Azov Nazis. Look, I come from a country where we had Nazis in parliament, the third largest party. That doesn't make, make the Greeks Nazis. So yes, there are Ukrainian Nazis. So what? This doesn't take away from the liberation struggle taking place today in Kharkiv, in Kiev, and so on. So let's, you know, every country has its Nazis. Uh, you know, even the, the best countries have them. <laughs> so let's, yeah. Uh, there is no such thing as a homogeneous country. That was just a brief aside. Look, um, I want to uh, address Volodymyr's point about uh, the European Union and whether it helps uh, for a roadmap towards membership of Ukraine. I don't think it does, Volodymyr. Let me, let me be clear. I'd, I'd like to have Ukraine in, in the EU, right? Um, I'd like to have Turkey in the EU today. It would be good for our comrades in Turkey, good for our comrades in Ukraine. But the number one question now is how do we stop the bombing of Kiev? How do we get the Russian troops out? That's the number one priority, right? So the question is what, whether it's you know, whatever we are um, assessing uh, as a possible help or hinder. Imagine that there is this announcement now by Brussels that, uh, yes, a road, roadmap is out, even you know, provisional membership of the EU by the Ukraine. Is this going to make it easier to strike a deal between Washington, D.C., uh, the American government, and Moscow and Putin, so that the, the Russian troops cease fire and withdraw from Ukraine? I don't think so. It will have the opposite effect. And in any case, Volodymyr, let me put it this way. The process that for, for accession to the EU is a process, a very awful process, exacted by Brussels. They are going to be putting you through different tests for years until you tick all the boxes. I don't think that this is the right way now. I think that it's the opposite. Ukrainians should be judging the European Union, not the European Union judging the Ukrainians. Uh, so let, the way I see it is this. If the European Union wants to help Ukraine at, Ukraine at the moment, right? Firstly, the European Union doesn't really exist as a serious geopolitical force. So we cannot, as a European Union, grant you the liberty from a Russian army that you need. The Americans can. So this is why I'm supporting an American-Russian agreement that guarantees your independence, and then the European Union can come in with aid, huge financial investment and technological investment in bringing up and building up Ukraine without any you know, box ticking by the bureaucrats in Brussels that pass judgment on you. No, the European Union wants to help. Okay, it can come in with the money and the infrastructure 
and the, 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 the know-how to help rebuild the Ukraine after Moscow and Washington agree on the way for, towards a, 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 you know, a kind of compromise between them that will allow your country freedom from conflict. Okay, and then later on, once you've been rebuilt, uh, yes, by all means, you know, uh, hopefully by that time, Russia will be free of Putin and Putin-esque uh, kind of regimes. But this is not for now. Uh, EU accession now is besides the point, it's unhelpful. Put the onus on the European Union to provide massive financial support to a, a Ukraine that gets rid of the Russians, the Russian troops, as a result of a global summit between the United States and Russia, maybe China, serious powers, not the European Union, which is a joke. Thank you, Yanis. And we'll need to stop it there because we've, we've gone past our, our hour. There's so much more to discuss on this, guys. It's been a really valuable discussion. Thank you so much uh, to all of you for, for doing this. We've only scratched the surface. And there will be other discussions on this because I am certain this issue will be with us for quite some time, unfortunately. Um, the chat has been raging. Apologies to, also to any of you out there that put um, comments or questions here. I, I haven't been able to keep up. And well, there's two of us doing this and neither of us have been able to keep up. But I hope you can continue the discussion in the comments of the video as well. Um, Thank you again, especially to those of you here for your very personal takes. Uh, I mean, Volodymyr and uh, Anna and any of you with friends and family in danger right now in Ukraine. Really appreciate um, you giving us your take. And um, please, if you'd like to join DM25 and not just be part of the debate, debate, but be part of the solution, the web address is dm25.org slash join. We have a petition, which is a, a, a small first step that you could do very easily in a couple of seconds, you can sign on. It's dm25.org slash peace. We'll be back next week, same time, same place um, with another discussion. Thank you very much for.